So welcome to the 2013 Penn State Lectures on the Frontiers of Science. This lecture series is a free mini course for the general public that we are pleased to be able to offer to you because of the financial support of the Penn State Eberly College of Science and also because of the generosity of our speakers who volunteer their time to give these lectures for us. Um, our theme this year is Your Genes, How They Contribute to Who You Are. Today's event is the fourth out of six lectures in this series. We have two more after this week. Our speaker today is Marilyn Ritchie, who is an associate professor of biochemistry and molecular biology, and she is the director of the Center for Systems Genomics at Penn State University. Her research spans the fields of biology, genetics, and statistics. It focuses on identifying and analyzing genes, interactions between genes, and interactions between the environment and genes that may increase susceptibility to common diseases. Some of these diseases include cancer, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. Among the honors she has received for her research are an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship and a Rising Young Investigator Award from the journal Genome Technology. Before coming to Penn State, Dr. Ritchie directed two computational genomics programs at Vanderbilt University. She also has served as, as, a, as a consultant to one of the world's leading pharmaceutical companies. The title of her lecture today is Personalized Medicine, Are We There Yet? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marilyn Ritchie. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, great. Um, if you can't hear me, just start waving your arms and I'll talk louder, but I tend to speak pretty loudly. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a series of stories about personalized medicine, um, how I got into the field will come up a little bit, and, and talk about where we are today. I get a lot of questions about, you know, is personalized medicine real? Are we actually doing personalized medicine? Or is this just a, a science fiction thing that scientists like to talk about? And, and so I'll tell you where we are today, and you can decide for yourselves if you think we're there yet. So what do I mean when I say personalized medicine? It, it means a lot of different things to different people, and some people are now calling this precision-based medicine. Um, some clinicians would argue that we've been doing personalized medicine since the age of time. Doctors personalize treatment for the person coming into the clinic. Um, and, but it's become kind of a, a common thing to talk about using genetics in the clinic as personalized medicine, and so some people are now referring to that as precision-based medicine. Um, so in case you read that or hear that, it, it, it means really the same thing to geneticists. And what we mean by this is looking at the right medicine for the right patient at the right dose at the right time. All of these things are equally important when you're thinking about personalizing treatment based on one's genetics. It's not just a matter of knowing whether somebody should or should not have a drug. We're also learning things about whether or not the dose that's typically prescribed that was learned in clinical trials is the right dose of the drug or whether the timing of the drug is important. And I'll give some examples today that will show genes that we've learned about where the type of treatment is important and where the dose of treatment is important and where the gene actually plays a role in the timing of the treatment. And so all of these will come up in the talk today. These are just some common images that you can get off of a Google search. It's become a really popular thing to talk about, you know, personalizing drugs where drug design is being done for a particular person. That is not happening quite as commonly because it's very expensive to manufacture a drug. What is more often the case is that drug companies are starting to do clinical trials where they'll look at the genetic um, ancestry of individuals and try to categorize them into different groups so that we can try to understand if the drug works well for certain groups of people rather than certain individuals specifically. But when we're thinking about personalized medicine, we do want to be able to find you know, the drug that's going to work for each person. And so I'm going to tell you a little story about how I got into this field. So when I was a graduate student back in 1999, I went to a lecture. 
I had not really heard much about personalized medicine. I was interested in genetics and helping people and learning about disease. And a scientist, um, Dr. Dan Roden, who was a professor at Vanderbilt University, gave a talk where he showed a picture of this guy. So I was a grad student in Nashville, Tennessee, and so you know, even though Elvis Presley is from Memphis, everybody in Nashville takes ownership of Elvis and, and the star that he was. And so he showed a picture of Elvis and his driver's license and said, you know, we have a lot of information on our driver's license. Wouldn't it be cool if on that barcode on the back of our driver's license, we could have our DNA code? And when we go to the doctor or we go to the pharmacy, we could just swipe our driver's license and they would go in the computer and say, oh, yep, you should be prescribed this drug. Or, oh, no, this is not the right drug for you. You're going to have an allergic reaction. And he talked about it in a very kind of way out in the future science fiction kind of way. And it comes to be that we're almost at this point. We're not there yet, but we are almost at this point. So what I thought sounded like the Jetsons from when I was a kid, you know, total science fiction flying cars, we're almost there at this point. He gave another example. We go to the doctors and we get our oxygen checked. You put your finger in the little thing and it'll beep and show what your, your oxygen levels are. He said, wouldn't it be cool if you could go to the doctor and stick your finger in and they could sequence you on the spot and tell you what your DNA sequence is and what variants in your DNA predict what drugs you should get, predict what diseases you're going to have, predict what responses you're going to have to the disease or drug treatment that we put you on. Again, this is still somewhat science fiction. Sequencing is not that fast, but it's almost that fast. It's definitely faster than it was back in 1999. And so I grabbed a few news articles that will be in your slides, and you can feel free to go look at them um, at your leisure. But So this is one just from a few weeks ago talking about um, personalized cancer treatment. So cancer is one area where personalized medicine is happening today in many, many places around the United States and around the world. Um, this is another article that I found from earlier this year talking about personalized medicine is almost here. I think it's here. Maybe the revolution isn't here. But we are personalizing treatment. So I'm going to show a series of examples that there are drugs that we now know what genetic variations in our DNA will explain how we respond to those drugs. And so I would argue that it's not almost here. It's here. We are living in the age of personalized medicine right now. And I'm going to talk some about kind of the benefits of personalized medicine and some of the limitations and where we need to be a little bit cautious. So this is an article or the cover of Time um, from 2013, Want to Know My Future. So I thought this was a really cute uh, cover that shows things like obesity and Parkinson's and asthma. We are learning a lot about our risk for disease and how our genes explain that risk. But this is not a new idea. So this is a cover of Time from 1971. So even back, which is before I was born, by the way, even then, we were talking about understanding our genes and how they make us who we are. So this is not a new thing that Time Magazine has grabbed onto. And here's a cover from 10 years ago, 2003. Again, solving the mysteries of DNA. I don't think we're going to stop seeing covers like this because as we learn more, in some ways we understand more and in other ways we're understanding less. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, a few other covers that I think are important to note. This is one from when we were sequencing the human genome for the very first time. Um, there was a race to sequence the genome. There was a uh, company that was doing the sequencing, and there was a government-sponsored group around the world doing the sequencing. They raced and finished at the same time. So this is two, these are two covers, Science and Nature magazines from 2001. One talked about the government-sponsored uh, project, and the other talked about the corporate-sponsored project. So 2001 is when we had the first draft genome sequence of humans, which is not so long ago. We've learned quite a bit since then. Uh, these were some early covers of time talking about human cloning. Um, no, we do not clone humans. No, we are not trying to clone humans. Human cloning is not closer than you think. So if there are any fears about that, um, I just want to, we're not going to talk about cloning today, but I wanted to make it clear that knowing our sequence actually is not allowing us to clone ourselves. In some days I wish I could because if I had two or three of me, I could get a lot more done, but we cannot clone ourselves yet. And why your DNA isn't your destiny. And I think this is telling. 
We can learn a lot about ourselves from our DNA, but not everything is in the genes. Our environment is very important, our diet, our nutrition. There are a lot of things that come into play. In addition, it's the complex interactions of our DNA, and that is where we don't understand a lot yet. So personalized medicine. I'm going to talk about some actual examples of truth and where we are today, where it's being used in clinics right now. So some of you could go to a clinic and be prescribed a drug where you could have your DNA evaluated and determine your dose or whether it's the right drug based on your sequence. I'm going to talk about you know, exactly where the limitations are today. And as always, as a scientist, we just keep calm and do the science. There are things we can learn. There are things we don't know yet. That's what makes us scientists. We keep asking the questions and trying to understand more. So here are some perspectives on why our field has shifted so fast since 2001. When the first draft sequence of the human genome was done back in 2001, it cost $100 million, and that was to sequence one human genome. Today, we're able to sequence genomes for less than $10,000, somewhere on the order of between five dollars and $10,000. That drop is faster than Moore's law, so it has dropped dramatically really since about 2006, 2007. And so we're seeing the ability to look at our DNA variation, so all of the bases in our DNA, very, very rapidly, which is very exciting and is giving us a lot of opportunity. Now, for people like me, fortunately, the cost of the analysis of the genome has not gone down. We may get to the point where genomes cost $1,000, which is the stated goal of the NIH. They want the cost of sequencing to be $1,000 a genome. The analysis is still at least $100,000, maybe more. And uh, this is a great article that talks about this. It's job security for people like me. I love articles like this. But it's important to note that just because we can generate the data, and we can generate the data very quickly, that doesn't mean that we can process, analyze, and understand all of the data quite yet. Now, there are some things that we know, and that's what I'll spend some time talking about. And at the end of the talk today, I'll talk about what we don't know and where some of the challenges are that we're facing today. So a few more perspectives. When the human genome was sequenced, this was the size of sequencing facilities around the world. The sequencing machines were huge. The rooms were the size of this room. They had dozens of sequencers, and they were all around the world. The computers that they used to analyze them, on each given machine, they had a computer. Now, they had lots and lots and lots of computers. But the size of the data has changed so quickly. Now, sequencing can be done on something the size of a thumb drive that you could plug into a laptop. Now, the quality, of course, is not the same with something like this compared to something like this at this point. But it's getting there. It's getting to the point that we could sequence our genome with a flash drive. Now, we can't store the data on a flash drive. The data has to go into a supercomputing center because it's terabytes of data. So these are not machines that you can go to Costco or Walmart to buy. These are machines that you have to have a lot of expertise to work with. So we can generate the data faster, and the data are really big, really big. And so it brings a lot of challenges. But with this information, we have learned a tremendous amount. So this figure is from the National Human Genome Research Institute, and my guess is that you probably saw this figure for those of you who were here last week. Eric Green, who spoke last week, is the director of NHGRI, and their group has spent a tremendous amount of time cataloging all of the genome-wide association studies that have been done. So these are assays where people looked at somewhere between 100,000 and a million or more bases in the DNA, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. So these are just single base changes in the DNA, and they've looked to see, are any of those associated with a disease? What we're showing here are all of the chromosomes, and each little colored dot is showing a particular association of a SNP, or single nucleotide polymorphism, with some class of disease. And so what you can notice is that you know, there are some chromosomes that have particular locations that have you know, up to six traits. Uh, there are certain regions that have dozens of traits associated with them. This particular region is of the MHC, or the major histone, compa major histone compatibility complex. Um, this is a region of the genome that's important for um, our immune responses. And so a lot of autoimmune diseases and infectious diseases and traits related to those associate with that region of the genome. And so as of this week, 
Um, this catalog includes over 1,500 papers and over 8,000 SNPs that are associated at a statistically significant level across the genome. That's a lot of information that we've learned. And the first genome-wide association study was only published in 2005. And so in the last seven to eight years, we've learned about 8,000 variants and their associations with hundreds of traits. This is very, very exciting. However, what we've also noted is that the distribution of how much of the heritability of these traits these variants explain is very small. So what I'm showing here are the number of associations, so the number of, number of SNPs that are associated and the strength of those associations. So these are odds ratios. An odds ratio of one means that there is no increased odds of disease if you have the variant or if you don't. And so you can see that, now these data are a little bit old, but the trend is the same and it just adds more data. The median odds ratio is 1.28. That is very small. So that means that the variants that we found, all those pretty colored dots on that plot, for the majority of them, they explain very little of the heritability of the trait. So that it means we're explaining very little of the actual trait itself and how it's being inherited. They're associated, but they don't explain a lot. Now here's an example of one of those genome-wide association studies. So this is Alzheimer's disease. What you're seeing here is the negative log 10 of the p-value, which is a measure of the statistical significance. And what you want are things above 8. So we've drawn a red line at 8. Anything above 8 is statistically significant across the genome. And you'll notice these are all of the chromosomes along here, and each dot is one SNP's association with Alzheimer's disease. What you can see here is there's this nice peak down here on chromosome 19. These are above that red line. So that's indicative that we have found a signal for Alzheimer's disease that is statistically significant across the whole genome. We looked at the whole genome, and this is the signal that we found. Now, I can tell you that that region of the genome is APOE. This was a region, a gene that we knew was associated with Alzheimer's disease for many, many years, back to the 80s. We didn't learn about it in a genome-wide association study, although this is a good proof of concept that this type of study can work. The odds ratio of something like APOE is very, very large. It's going to be out here in this region of, you know, 5 to 10 to higher, depending on the size of the data set and the type of data set that you're working with. So effects like that are, are fairly easy to find in a genome-wide association study. A lot of other traits that we've looked for, like type 2 diabetes, Crohn's disease, obesity, have much, much smaller effects, which means that while we know lots of our DNA variations that are associating with these traits, they're not explaining or predicting a lot of the trait. That said, there are a few that we've learned about for pharmacogenetics or for personalized medicine. So pharmacogenetics is looking at drug response due to genetic variation, and that's what we're using for personalized medicine. Um, this is a figure from a paper that my PhD mentor published that I really, really like. So it shows this low-hanging fruit. Some would argue that what we have found so far in all of these genome studies that we're doing are the low-hanging fruit. We're finding things that have the biggest effects on their own. We're finding things that, um, that we're able to find given the current analytic technologies that we're working with, which is why my lab spends so much time working on new techniques to work with the data and to analyze the data. We want to be able to find all the fruit. We don't want the APOE fruit. We want all the rest of the fruit. We want to understand and be able to predict who is going to develop disease and who's not. So like I said, some of these low-hanging fruit for personalized medicine we have found, and they've been very fruitful. Here's an example of a genome-wide association study plot. So again, these are the p-values, the negative log base 10. We want things above 8. And I'm showing in red here this nice peak down on chromosome 16. This is a genome-wide study that I was involved with, and the, uh, the phenotype or the, the trait that we were looking at is drug response to the drug warfarin or Coumadin. This is a blood thinner. So when uh, individuals develop this condition where they're unable to maintain the proper level of blood thinning, they go on warfarin or Coumadin. It prevents people from going into a, a clotting issue or from going into a hemorrhaging issue. It maintains that pro appropriate level of, of blood. So what I'm going to show here are two hits. VCOR C1, or vitamin K um, epoxide reductase, is here. This was a new hit that we learned about in genome-wide association studies. 
Down here in blue is CYP2C9. This gene has been known to be associated with warfarin dose for a decade. It's way down here. It's not significant in a genome-wide study, but we know about it. It's functional. It actually changes protein levels, and it actually predicts what dose a person should be on to maintain the right level of blood thinning. So why is it not statistically significant in this genome-wide study? This stunned us, and it worried us quite a bit. So we went on. This is the publication, in case anybody wants to look for it. It's, it's in the handout. Um, a, few, a subsequent study went back and did the study again with a much, much bigger data set. And when they did that, that CYP2C9 variant was genome-wide significant. And so we think in our initial study, our sample size to the number of people in our study was just too small, and we couldn't get that level of significance that, that we needed to be considered statistically significant. However, we know that it's real. We know that it's actually functionally associated with dosing of warfarin. And so that led to a lot of additional studies. We published one in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2008, where we specifically looked at VCOR C1, which is on the top panel, and CYP2C9, which is on the bottom. On the left, you're looking at the time to the first INR in a therapeutic range. INR is a clinical test that they do. When you go on warfarin, you get an INR measurement, and that's going to measure kind of how well that drug is titrating in your system. There's a certain range that your INR needs to be in for it to be safe and be considered a stable dose. And if you're not in that range, they either raise the dose or lower the dose because they don't want you to bleed out or to clot. And so it's really done by a trial and error and getting multiple blood tests done once you go on the drug. And then what we're showing on the right is the time to the first INR greater than four, which is, have, is way out of range. So that's a bad thing. So what we learned is that VCOR C1 is associated with the initial dosing of the drug. So to make sure that you get on the right dose early, the VCOR C1 variant predicts what your dose should be. CYP2C9 is not associated with that initial dose. It's associated with the maintenance dose, the dose that you stay on over time to make sure that you stay in the right range. And so they're both important, but this is a case where the timing of the dosing and the timing of the experiment plays a role in, in understanding which genetic variation is important. So VCOR C1 is important at initiation of the dose. CYP2C9 is important for the maintenance dose. Both are associated. Now, both are actually implemented in the clinic, and we'll talk more about that. Um, because of all the studies done on warfarin, the FDA, or Food and Drug Administration, changed the label on warfarin. So it is actually on the label now that genetic testing can and should be done if you're going to go on warfarin. Not all clinics are doing that, but many clinics around the country are. Um, it's a test that can be ordered online. So I found a website where you can call now and send in a sample, and they can genotype you and tell you what your genotypes are so that you could know what your warfarin dose is. And I actually know some people who have done not this particular test, but have had their genotyping done in case they had to go on warfarin later, and then they went into their clinic and said, oh, by the way, doc, here's what my dose should be, and, which is a little scary because they're not physicians. But, um, but it's important to know if you might go on warfarin because I personally would rather go on the right dose to start with and not have to get pricked seven times and go up and down and up and down and have a bleeding event and have a clotting event until they get it right. So we're definitely able to use these variants in the clinic today. Another story, clopidogrel. So clopidogrel is a drug that individuals go on when they've had a heart attack. Um, typically, you'll get a stent placement, and you'll go on clopidogrel to prevent a subsequent heart attack or myocardial infarction. It was learned just a few years ago that CYP2C19 has a variant that indicates whether a person is actually responsive to clopidogrel. So if you have a variant in this gene, your body has no response to the drug. The drug is not metabolized properly, and so it's as though you're not taking it at all. So this is their genome-wide association study plot. So again, these are the p-values. We're looking for things above 8. The negative log base 10 of the p-value. Let me correct myself. And we're looking for things above 8 and all the chromosomes. And here's that cluster of CYP2C19. There are functional variants in that region, and one particular variant that has been shown to explain 
the function of clopidogrel in individuals. And this study was actually done in an Amish population, an old order, order Amish population, I believe from central and, and eastern Pennsylvania, and then it was replicated or it was seen again in another data set of unrelated cases and controls. So people who um, responded to clopidogrel and people who did not. And so this is a known variant that we have found in genome-wide studies and has been validated and is being used in the clinic. Now a little bit of a cautionary tale. So I showed you earlier that CYP2C9 was not genome-wide significant. A study that I was involved with after the genome-wide study tried to validate the result of CYP2C19. We validated it, but barely. Our p-value was 0 .003. To be considered significant in a genome-wide study, you need to have seven zeros before that three. So it should be 0 .000, you know, 10 to the minus eight. Our result was not significant if we had done a genome-wide study, which troubled me a little bit. So at this point, we were talking about implementing this in the clinic at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, which is where I was working at the time. And I thought, the result is not that significant in our study. I don't know that we should put this into the clinic and actually treat patients based on this information because it's not that statistically significant. So I was very, very uncomfortable with it. That said, it was replicated in many other studies, and the, the final decision was to actually implement that in the clinic. And so this is a project called PREDICT. They have actually implemented three drugs at Vanderbilt University, clopidogrel, warfarin, and simvastatin. I'm going to show you a little video clip, and some of you may have already seen this because the media blitz from Vanderbilt has been pretty significant on this topic. I became a cardiologist so I can help well people stay well. The reason I work at Vanderbilt is because they have a commitment to prevention and to personalized medicine. Statin medicines are an important part of that. Using a patient's DNA profile, we're now able to predict which patients might have serious side effects or complications to a very common statin. It means I can customize treatment for each patient. This is truly an exciting time to practice medicine. Okay. So as you can see, statins are another example, and I'm not going to show all of the data from the statins, but basically with statin treatment, and simvastatin in particular, there are people that develop a severe adverse rea reaction called rhabdomyolysis, really severe muscular pain, and there's a certain variant that can predict who will have that response, and it's great to know that in advance. We don't give those patients simvastatin. They're given a different statin. There's a whole class of statin drugs, and they don't all respond in the same way. They're all metabolized differently. And so knowing this information, we're able to change the drug that one individual will get and hopefully prevent one of those toxic side effects from happening. So as I said, all three of these drugs are currently implemented in the clinic at Vanderbilt, and I know a lot about that because I worked there for eight years, but they're also being implemented at the Mayo Clinic, they're being implemented at Duke University, um, Mount Sinai is starting an implementation, Geisinger Clinic is starting an implementation in Danville, um, there are a number of them, Marshfield Clinic in Wisconsin. So lots of healthcare facilities are starting to implement these variants that we know are predictive of response. And so it's a very, very exciting time. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the clopidogrel story. So this was an article that came out in the Pharmacogenomics Reporter back in 2010. So this is when the PREDICT study initiated at Vanderbilt. And I shouldn't call it a study. It was the PREDICT program. So this was not a research project. This was changing clinical care based on DNA variation. So these patients were genotyped even before they needed the drugs. So these were people who were going to clinic for a lot of different conditions. And they recognized that these people were likely to need warfarin, clopidogrel, or simvastatin at some point in their clinical care. And they just started genotyping them and putting it into their medical record before they needed it. So this is a screenshot of the medical record at Vanderbilt, and you can see it has things like your different diagnoses, what procedures you've had done, the medications you're on. What they've done now is added another column of genotypes, and they're actually putting the genotypes that we know are predictive of drug response into the record. So right now, there are only three going into the record, or four, vcor c one CYP2C9, CYP2C19, and SLCO1B1 which is the one for the statins. These are four genes, four variants that are being put in, and that's all. I've listed others because the hope is to be able to put a lot of other variants into the record. 
but we're not quite at that point yet. So they have a few of them in the record. Um, as a scientist, where the p-values weren't really significant, it made me very, very nervous. And I was very uncomfortable with it. But for the clinicians, they said, you know, we practice evidence-based medicine. And in some cases, the statistical evidence from your genetic studies is more than we have for the PSA testing that we're doing or mammogram screening. Your evidence is just as statistically significant as much of that. And we're doing that all the time. And the other thing to keep in mind is do no harm. So the variants that we're learning about have alternative treatments that are safe and FDA approved. And so it's not as though learning these variations is causing individuals to have no treatment or to have a treatment that is risky. It's just a different treatment. And so I'll talk some more about some of those. Um, so this is the first individual that we know personalized medicine worked for in this study at Vanderbilt. So this woman had a heart attack back in 2010 and she received a stent placement and went on clopidogrel. She had another instant thrombosis, was re-stented, and then again, and again, and again, and again, and this woman had eight stent placements. Eight! I started to ask the question whether the course of treatment was appropriate to begin with. How can someone have this many stent placements and they stay on this drug that is clearly not working? This person is on Medicare. This is the generic drug. This is the drug. It's the first line treatment. It is what everyone goes on when they have this event. So they did exactly what they were supposed to do. So late in 2010, this woman was genotyped as part of PREDICT and found to be homozygote rare variant. So that means she has two copies of the variant that says it is as though she doesn't have the drug at all, which I could have predicted based on her response. However, they now knew this, and so they switched her to a different drug called Prazagril. Prazagril functions in a similar way, but is metabolized very differently. It is still patented, which means it's not, there's no generic form. It's much more expensive than clopidogrel, which is why clopidogrel is the first-line treatment. She went on to Prazagril, and as of two years later, had not had another event. And so she was thrilled. I mean, personalized medicine worked for her absolutely unequivocally prevented her from having another heart attack and stent placement. And so even though this variant in our study at Vanderbilt had a p-value of 0 0.003, it was not so significant, it clearly was significant for this woman and worked for her. And so I was at this point convinced that this was not a bad thing. Um, this is also being done at a lot of other clinics. So St. Jude Children's Research Hospital has a huge implementation project in their leukemia area. They have changed the face of leukemia in kids around the world. The way that they're treating leukemia now based on an individual's genetic profile is just remarkable and it's working tremendously well. Um, cancer is another area, so this is Vanderbilt's website, but I was looking, you could find these on Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic. They are all starting to personalize cancer treatment based on genetics. We can look at what variations either in our germline or our DNA or the cancer tumor DNA and predict whether the cancer will respond to this chemotherapeutic, chemotherapeutic or that chemotherapeutic, whether it will respond to radiation or not. And so we're learning a lot about cancers as well. So how do you decide what to implement? And this, I was in a lot of meetings and had a lot of discussions. Because like I said, I was very nervous about the statistical significance. And the physicians explain there are a lot of things that we use in terms of evidence. So we look at the effect size. So the effect size is, is that odds ratio or that heritability measure. How much of the trait does this variant explain? If it explains a good amount, which that clopidogrel variant does, then it's worth implementing. Um, how statistically significant does it replicate or validate in other studies? Do we know that it's functional in cells? Do we know that it actually changes proteins? All of those things become important. And the other, pit, uh, other tidbit that is key is what is the alternative course of action? If it's just a matter of modifying the dose, prescribing a different drug, or just having a different therapeutic plan, then why not? If we know that this alternative is also safe, it's just not first-line therapy because it's more expensive, then there's no reason not to implement these variants, and, and I would agree. And so the warfarin dosing, 
and clopidogrel are being done. Um, they have a clinical variable equation that is typically used to estimate dose. This has things like our ancestry, our gender, our age, our body mass index. That's typically how a doctor prescribes warfarin. And so right now, um, they are using this equation and comparing it to using the genetics to see, does using the genetics get us to that stable dose faster? And I haven't seen the results of that study yet, but they are definitely trying to do that. Um, but the rest of the treatment is staying the same. So you're monitored with that INR, whether you're going on the clinical dose or the genetic predicted dose. Um, and so it's not as though if you're on the wrong dose and your genetics was wrong, it's going to be dangerous for you. The doctor is going to treat you in the same way that he would treat you if they did the clinical dose. And so we should see in another year or so kind of the actual statistical results of that um, analysis. Similarly with clopidogrel, all they're doing is switching to prazogrel instead of clopidogrel and looking at outcomes over time. And so again, because this just started a few years ago, we don't have any data yet to know, you know did it actually change the face of therapy for the population of patients. We should know that soon. We know it changed the therapy or the course for that one person who you know, came forward and was interviewed about it. Um, so we should see in another year or two the data to support whether or not this is working um, broadly. Okay, so I want to spend a few minutes to talk about kind of the, the, not, the, the scary part of the truths. So I gave you examples that personalized medicine is here and it is working for certain variants. But there's a lot that we don't know. So if most of the effects that we're finding are really small, and they explain something like 1 to 5 to 10 percent of the heritability of traits that we know from twin studies done back in the 70s and 80s that the heritability estimates for some of these traits are 40 percent or 50 percent or 70 percent, and we have found the genes that explain 10 percent, where is the rest of the heritability? So this is a really popular paper that talks about where the heritability might be. This is the case of the missing heritability. It's a huge problem that a lot of people are talking about and working on. We've done hundreds of thousands of genomes, and we don't have the rest of the heritability. Where is it? Well, the paper talks about a lot of places where it might be. So under our nose is indicating that it's in the data. We just didn't do the analysis quite right. And if you look at the data slightly differently, you'll find the variants that are important. Out of sight is the idea that, you know, these genome-wide chips are only measuring a million variants across our genome, and we have six billion. And a lot of them are very rare, and so they're unique to our person or our family, or they're just not very common in the population. Those variants were not assayed. They weren't looked at or investigated in all those genome-wide studies from that NHGRI catalog. And so there's a lot of variation that we just haven't looked at yet. And maybe all the heritability is in those variants. Maybe it's in the architecture, which is the idea that we have structural variation in our genes. We have copy number variants, so genes where we have multiple copies. This is something that um, you'll hear a lot about in the sixth lecture of the series. Dr. Scott Selleck works a lot on copy number variants, and so I'm sure he'll talk about those. Um, and also epigenetics, and these are kind of Changes in the DNA, chromatin structure, and histone modifications. These are lots of molecular biology things that we know happen to the DNA, how the DNA is structured and wound together, and how it, comes un how it unwinds before transcription and translation and become you know, DNA to RNA to protein. There's a lot in that structural variation that we don't fully understand yet. And maybe some of the heritability should be measured in there. Um, underground networks, which is my personal favorite and what I'll spend a few minutes talking about, is the concept that underlying biology is complex and we have lots of networks and pathways that interact. And if we look one gene at a time, we're going to miss all of those complex networks and interactions. Lost in diagnosis is uh, a concern that we all have and we hope that it's not the case, but a lot of these studies are done where people are, are collected and they are put into bins. These people have the disease and these people don't. And pick a disease like type 2 diabetes. Well, if you know people with type 2 diabetes, you know that phenotypically or symptomatically, they're all very different. But in a genetic study, we put them all together. Similarly with Alzheimer's disease. Everybody with Alzheimer's goes into one study as cases and then controls are the people who don't have Alzheimer's. We know in looking at Alzheimer's individuals, they're very different. 
Some have very violent tempers. Some have uh, a lot of depression. Some revert to childlike behaviors and mannerisms. Not all. So is the genetic etiology for all of those different symptoms the same or different? Probably different. And so if it's lost in diagnosis, and part of the problem is that our studies should have been kind of sliced and diced into different case sets, um, our sample sizes are going to get much smaller, but, but maybe that's where we need to go to figure out the genes that explain each of these sets of symptoms. And then the great beyond. As a geneticist, we tend to ignore the environment because the environment is so hard to measure. Our DNA is easy. We can get a blood sample or spit in a tube and get our DNA, and it doesn't change. The DNA we were born with is the DNA that we die with. It's super easy to measure. Our environment changes throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month, over the years. If you ask people, what environmental toxins have you been exposed to? What was your diet? You know, what what toxins have you ingested? Have you worked near heavy metals? Have you ever been exposed to lead? We don't know that stuff. We don't remember. I can't remember what I ate for dinner last night, so I'm certainly not going to be able to give you my last week's dietary questionnaire information. And so collecting the environment is really hard. But I would bet that a lot of our genes are only important in the context of the environment that we're putting them in, which is why you have some people who smoke and never develop lung cancer and other people who smoke, and they do. And then other people who never smoke and get lung cancer. Somehow, smoking interacts with certain genomes and not with others. And so understanding the environment is going to be key to understanding some of that heritability. But what I spend most of my time working on and what keeps me up at night is the complexity of biology and the fact that we simplify it in all of our studies. And, and I'm guilty as anyone. Biology is hard, and it's complex, and if we don't simplify it, it's too hard to do the analysis. And so if you look, you know, do a Google search for biology and pathways, you'll find hundreds of images like this that have genes that explain or interact with other genes, genes that interact with pathways, we have feedback loops, we have compensatory mechanisms, we have all sorts of things that happen in biology that when we look one gene at a time and try to find the one gene that explains a really complex disease like schizophrenia, it, that's why we're not finding the gene. There probably isn't one gene. It's probably a dozen genes or a hundred genes. And so how do we find the dozen or the 10 or the 50? And the other problem is that molecular biology is very complex. So we're only focused on DNA. Everything I've talked about has been variation in DNA. A lot happens from DNA to RNA to protein to cells to organs to organisms. We ignore all of that other variability because it's challenging. And for years, we weren't able to assay the RNA and protein expression well enough to do the studies. Today, we are. The new sequencing technologies have enabled us to actually get whole genome measures of gene expression and of protein expression and of metabolomics and add omics onto any word and we can pretty much measure it now. And so a lot of work is being done to try to integrate all of these ohms, the genome, the proteome, the phenome, the transcriptome, the metabolome, the microbiome, all together to try to understand if we can understand more about these complex traits. So actually treating them in a complex way, which is probably how we should be doing it since they are underlying complex traits. So, as a very naive graduate student in 1999, when we were talking about how one day we will be able to measure 500,000 SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, across the genome. And won't that be amazing? And then we'll be able to understand these complex traits. Because at that time, studies were very small. So my PhD project was on 25 SNPs. That was it, 25 SNPs. I studied breast cancer. and that was a big study back in 99. My grad students, I think, laugh at me when I tell them my studies were 25 SNPs because theirs are 13 million, and you know, they could do the 25 SNP analysis on their iPhone or their Android, but still, that was a big study back in 99. And so I said, well, there's going to come a time that we'll have 500,000, but if we think that interactions are important, can't we just exhaustively look for all the combinations of genes? Because with my 25 SNPs, I was looking for all the pairwise interactions and all the three-way and all the four-way, and I just ran exhaustive tests of all of the effects to see what I could find. And my PhD mentor said, well, 
I don't know, can you exhaustively look at 500,000 SNPs? So I went and did the math. So this is the number of combinations. If you're looking at single SNP models, so one SNP at a time, that's 500,000 tests. And at the time, we were thinking, well, maybe for something like cancer, it's five SNPs. So five different variants that are important. That would be 2 times 10 to the 26th tests. Can you do that? Well, back then, we could do about one computation per second. It was going to take me 10 to the 21th days. And I did not want to be a grad student for that long, so I said, okay, this isn't going to work. Um, I recently redid the math because we now have 5 million SNPs in a lot of studies. We're up to 10 to the 20th days. We cannot, even with computers that can do a million tests per second, because our computers have gotten much, much faster, we still cannot exhaustively do all the combinations in the genome. And that's just looking at five SNPs. Do I really think that schizophrenia is due to five SNPs? Probably not. It's probably two dozen or 50 or 100. I don't know how many. But we can't look at all of them. So how long is 10 to the 20th days? Just to give some perspective, the Big Bang Theory, um, not the show, which, by the way, this is what my whiteboard in my office looks like. And every time my mother-in-law comes in, she says, Oh, you look like Sheldon, and, and I don't. Anyway, Big Bang Theory, 10 to the 12th days. That was the beginning of time, and it's going to take 10 to the 20th to exhaustively look at 5 million SNPs in five-way combinations. It's not going to happen. We need to be smarter than that, um, which is fortunate for people like me who want to come up with smart, interesting algorithms. And so this is a toolbox, and what most people in my field do is they grab the hammer. They do their standard genome-wide association study because it works. It found vCoreC1, it found CYP2C19. If we use a hammer, we will find the low-hanging fruit, which is true. Everybody in my lab knows how to use the hammer or the standard statistical test. When it works, it's fantastic. But it doesn't always work. And so we're trying other tools. We're developing what we call meta-dimensional analysis. These are the ideas that we integrate DNA, RNA, and protein all into the analysis in a more systems biology or systems genomics kind of way. That's one approach that we're taking in addition to many other labs around the world. We're doing pathway analysis. So instead of considering any one gene, we're looking at the pathway as a whole. And we're looking to see are there certain pathway effects that we observe more in people with a disease than you would expect just in a random subset of people without the disease. We're looking at genomic convergence. This is the idea that regions of the genome that show evidence of association from SNP tests, or they show evidence in linkage studies, which were studies that were done in families back in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. Um, do we see regions of the genome that have increased expression? You know, can we look for those regions that keep coming up? So that chromosome 6 region that comes up in a lot of traits. We focus on that region quite a bit because we see it come up from multiple different types of data. Um, the biofilter is a tool that we work on trying to integrate information from the literature. So there are decades of biological information out there in PubMed and in journals and in databases. Can we pull all that information and use that to s more intelligently look at the data? Rather than looking at the genome broadly and trying to test everything, which we can't do, let's focus our analyses to things that we know interact with one another in biological systems. Do any of those interactions then associate with our trait? So that's another approach that we're taking. And then polygenic modeling is a statistical technique that people are using to try to look at combinations of variants. And this has been done quite a bit in um, schizophrenia and in bipolar and in multiple sclerosis. And they're finding that if you take these genome-wide chips that have a million variants, and you try to find subsets that fit in a polygenic model, um, they can find models that have up to 20,000 SNPs that they can be sure that the functional ones are in there. They can't tell you which of the 20,000 they are, but at least they have filtered it down to a smaller set. And if we had 20,000, we could start to look for interactions there and exhaustively look for interactions. That's a much easier space. And so that's another technique that some people are using to try to get the data into something much more manageable. OK, I have two slides that aren't in your handout. I decided to add these um, to have you do a little bit of a thought experiment. And so one of the challenges that we have is that we don't know what types of models we're looking for. We think they're complex. That's the whole reason that we're developing more complex techniques. We've tried the simple stuff, and it didn't work. And so we're trying something more complex. If the 
fitness landscape, which is the, the space of all possible models, looks something like this, where you have all models that you could test. These are statistical models of combinations of genes or of pathways, and the fitness, or how well these models explain the heritability of the trait, looks like this. It's a pretty simple landscape to find the solution. So if you imagine, so everybody close your eyes, and imagine that you are in a helicopter, and someone is going to drop you out of the helicopter safely with a blindfold on. And your challenge is to get to the peak of this mountain. And so you take a step forward. If you go up, you're going in the right direction. If you go down, you're clearly going in the wrong direction. And so you turn. And you keep taking steps in one direction or another, only moving in a direction where you're going to go up, because you're trying to find the peak of the mountain. So if you climb and you take your blindfold off and you, any way you step, you go down, you've reached the peak of the landscape. This is how most statistical stepwise methods works. We make tiny changes to models and see which one improves. We put this gene in, it makes it better, we keep it. We put this gene in, it improves it, we keep it. Put this gene in, it makes it worse, we take it back out. And we make little tiny stepwise changes in the hopes that we'll find the model that explains our trait, disease, phenotype. Unfortunately, I think the reality of biological landscapes is that they look like this. So if you were dropped out of a helicopter into Waimea Canyon um, safely, hopefully you'll find a peak. But if you took your blindfold off here, you would see that you're still in the valley. There are many, many, many other peaks much higher than you. Not to mention there, there isn't only one peak. There are dozens of peaks. And so if complex traits are actually like this, and there are multiple models that make sense, and there is no one solution, these analyses where we're making tiny incremental changes and looking for one model are never going to get us there. We have to do something smarter where we search more of the landscape and we allow for the, the possibility that there are a dozen models that explain type 2 diabetes or 15 models that explain obesity. This idea of looking for only one is not going to get us there. Now, for things like warfarin and clopidogrel, it did. That was a landscape like this. We have found those variants, which is fantastic, and it's changing lives today. However, we're not quite there for everything. And so that brings us to what does this mean for you? So I like to talk about 23andMe, which is a company that allows an individual, so anybody in the audience can go home today and go to this website and order a kit and get your own whole genome genotyping done. So you can get up to a million variants on yourself. They'll send you a kit, you spit in a test tube, you, they have some mouthwash, and you swish it around and spit in the tube and send it back. And in a number of weeks or months, they will send back a, an email with a code and you can log on and download your DNA sequence at these million positions. So it's not full sequence, it's just a million of, your, of the DNA variants. Right now, it's $99. I mean, that is less than my car insurance. So I could go and get my genome done. And thousands and thousands of people have done this, which is super exciting. And there used to be a couple companies that did it, and primarily this is the one now. When you're on there, and this is an older screenshot, it used to be $2.99. I think when it first came out, it was more like $6.99, so it's really dropped quite a bit. Um, you can learn about your ancestry, and you can learn about your health, and you get a lot of information by doing something like this. Um, you can also get your whole genome sequence done, so there are a few companies, Complete Genomics and Gnome, that you can do a similar process and get your full genome sequence. It costs much more, more like $10,000, um, Ozzy Osbourne is one individual who has, has his done. Um, I would love to get my hands on that data because he's a very interesting character that I would love to understand, you know, what makes him tick. Um, but that data is not currently publicly available. Um, but you can do this. Today, you could go home and order a kit and get your genome sequenced as well. So this is often called direct-to-consumer sequencing or direct-to-consumer GWAS, genome-wide association study. What do you get? Um, so I'm going I'm to kind of give you the pros and cons. It can be dangerous, and it can be very interesting. And it's all a matter of how you use the information. So 23andMe will give back information. It'll tell you 48 traits that you are the carrier status of. That means that you are carrying a variant for a particular trait, but most of these are traits that you need two copies to actually present with the disease. 
And so these are really important for people who are in their reproductive age thinking about having kids and whether if they're a carrier and their spouse is a carrier, you know, what is the risk that their offspring will then have the trait? There are 120 disease risks and conditions that they'll give you information for. So it'll tell you how, what at risk you are for cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, male pattern baldness, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer. A lot of these are in there. They'll give you 21 drug responses. Clopidogrel and warfarin and simvastatin are in there, among others. And 57 traits. These are things like freckling, height, red hair. Um, those things, most people kind of already know what their risk is because you can look in the mirror and figure out what you are. But you can find out if your genetics explained who you have become. Um, and the redhead gene is on there. And uh, I've been told by many, it's a particular mutation that causes the disease. Um, of red hair, which I would argue is not a disease, but that's neither here nor there. Most of these associations that are on there are from genome-wide association studies. So remember I showed you the odds ratios were teeny tiny. They don't explain a lot of the traits. And so the odds ratio estimates or the risks that they give you are estimated from data that what it was found was very, very small. That said as well, the, most of the GWAS studies that have been done are in European-American populations or European populations. And so people who are of other ancestries, the risk predictions either can't be done or they're not as accurate because our DNA varies quite a bit from population to population. Um, so this is a screenshot of type 2 diabetes risk. This is from their website. This is not my own. I have not had mine. I don't have my sequence. I don't have my genome-wide um, study done. I come from a long line of hypochondriacs, and the last thing I need is more data to support that and tell me what I'm at risk for. I know based on family history, and that is sufficient for me personally, though many of my colleagues have done this, and they think it's awesome and a lot of fun. But here's the type 2 diabetes risk. So green is showing decreased risk, and red is showing increased risk. And the, they're showing a number of variants from genome studies for type 2 diabetes risk. So this particular person is at decreased risk for a bunch of markers and at increased risk for a bunch of markers. Hmm. So are you at risk or are you not? Some markers say you are, some markers say you're not. What do you do with that? It's going to give you a risk prediction. It's going to give you a number and say, based on these variants, your risk is two times that of the population or 1% that of the population. But those are hard to estimate given you know, they're not conclusive. They're not all trending in the same direction. Now, there are many, many stories. Do I want to shift yet? No. There are many stories of these risk predictions that have come out that they're, they either work or they don't, and it's very individual. So I had a colleague that did this. Um, he was told that he was at decreased risk for male pattern baldness, and he was shiny since he was 30. His head is shiny as can be, and so it was wrong. He was also told that he was at increased risk for ovarian cancer, which he found interesting because as far as he knows, he doesn't have ovaries. <laughs> this is a problem. I know other individuals who were told that they were at increased risk for cardiovascular events. They went into the doctor and had some tests run, and sure enough, they had an increase in atherothrotic um, plaques, and they needed to go on treatment. They had no symptoms yet, but they were nervous. They had a family history. They went in, got tested, and they needed it. I know another person who had to go on warfarin, and he took this to his physician and said, look, look at this. Please prescribe my dose based on 23andMe. I know this data is accurate. Use it. Um, there are lots of stories like this. So it's not all bad. For some traits, it works. For others, it doesn't. Um, this does have things in here about breast cancer risk, uh, Parkinson's risk, and Alzheimer's risk. Now, all three of these are harder to get to. They're not in your initial report. You have to actually kind of click extra buttons to access that. Those are some of those trigger diseases that people don't want to know. You know, if you ask 100 people, everybody would love to know their risk for type 2 diabetes or obesity or some of these things that we can prevent, although we should be eating right and exercising and not smoking or drinking and getting plenty of sleep, yet many people don't do that anyway. So I'm not sure that our DNA profile telling us that we're at increased risk for diabetes is going to change our diet, but, but I've heard one story of a faculty member at Stanford that it did. 
Um, it showed he was at risk for diabetes. He changed his diet, lost 10 pounds. His glucose levels went from slightly out of normal back to normal. And you know, I argued with him that he should have done that anyway. He didn't need his DNA to tell him that. But, but he used the DNA evidence to make the change in his lifestyle, which made a difference in his, in his outcome. Um, but like I said, people are doing this also because it's very interesting. Um, you learn about your ancestry. So one of my colleagues, her mom is from Mexico, her dad is from the U.S. She could see kind of where her mitochondrial genome came from, you know, from her mother and where it came from originally. And she could look to see what regions of Europe her dad's, y or her dad's regions of his genome came from because he was also done. Um, you can learn about your family structure. Um, a word of caution there is that families that do this can learn about non-paternity. So in any genetic study, Kind of on average, the report is that when we study families, about 10% of the, our participants, we find evidence of non-paternity that is not reported. We see it in the, the DNA. We can tell that dad is not dad. We don't ever report that, um, but I know a lot of families that are getting this done, like for Christmas. That's not the type of gift you want to open. <laughs> so be careful. If you know something, this is going to tell you. It's going to tell everybody in your family. So if you know, just don't do it. Just have other reasons to not do the, the analysis. But I've heard horror stories about that happening. It can tell you about dietary risk. So you learn things in here about you know, lactose intolerance or um, you know, your risk for obesity or how you can process different nutrients. And so that might be useful. You might um, learn that you have risks for celiac disease and, and change and eat less gluten. And maybe that would change some of your your outcome. Maybe you don't have full celiac disease yet, but changing your diet, some would prevent it from happening. Um, and then there's a lot of pharmacogenetics. So these are those genes that explain drug response. They're in there. And for that, it's very useful because a lot of those are actually predictive and work. Um, so there, I'm going to wrap up. I want to acknowledge um, work like this is done by teams of people. So I'm not even going to show all of the teams at Vanderbilt. It was many, many people that I collaborated with for a decade. Um, I also got my graduate degree in my first faculty position there, and so I was there for 12 years and, and worked a lot with various people. But my lab here at Penn State um, has a number of people, graduate students, some undergrads, software developers, data analysts, program managers, kind of doing this kind of complex analysis and methods development is a lot of work. And, and so I just want to acknowledge, you know, this is team science. Genomics is always team science. And, you know, I get to be the one to get up here and talk about all the fun stuff we do, but there's a, a lot that goes on behind the scenes that, that I'm very thankful and grateful that people do all that work. Um, and so I will stop there. Um, I like to show this slide. You know, a lot of people criticize the idea of these complex modeling tools because we don't have good examples of complex models yet, so why are you looking for them? And, and I would argue just because we haven't found it doesn't mean it's not there. That's why I'm a scientist, to try to discover things and learn things and find things that we didn't previously know. And so we use techniques that do um, evolution in computers. It's a technique called genetic programming. And we try to evolve computer programs to solve our problems. It's a really fascinating area of computer science, and it's a lot of fun. Um, and here's my lab website and my email address if you have questions or want to look up more information about what we do. And I'll stop there, and, and Barbara can take the questions. Thank you. Hold your questions up, please, so they can be collected for you. Um, Dr. Ritchie, let's see. Oops. Um, first question. In addition to the medical conditions in your presentation, are there other medical conditions that now are already being treated with personalized genomic medicine and also, what medical conditions do you think might be added to this list soon? Let's see. Um, so a lot of different cancers. Um, some of the infectious diseases are being researched quite a bit. So um, HIV is one that we're now starting to understand who has variation in their DNA that even when they're exposed to the virus, they will never go on to develop AIDS. They're essentially protected from the infection, and so um, they are treated a little bit differently because they never actually develop the disease. Um, and then HIV drug treatment is another one I didn't talk about, but we've learned about various um, adverse reactions to HIV drugs that 
are really, really terrible. I mean, the HIV drugs are almost worse than the disease in terms of, of the side effects. And so we now understand um, why people are developing peripheral neuropathy. So they essentially lose feeling in their fingers and toes and, and extremities. And so they're given different treatments. Um, we're learning about people that have uh, liver failure due to HIV drugs, and they're getting different treatment. And then also um, there's this hypersensitivity where um, it's called Stevens-Johnson syndrome. It happens from a couple of different drugs. Um, you could Google it if you want. I, I thought about putting up the images and decided in case anybody had a snack with them, it's not appropriate. It's a, a condition where your body breaks out in these red splotches and hives that they're in your eyelids, in your mouth, on your lips, the skin, their hands swell up. It's a horrible, horrible side effect. And we know what genetic variation in HLA predicts it. And so now they're starting to genotype people for that so that they don't give them this particular abacavir is the name of the drug that has this horrible, horrible side effect. Um, so there are a number of areas where it is also being done. Where do I think it'll go next? Um, I think more of the uh, cardiovascular drugs because there's a lot of research going on there, um, a lot of the statin-related drugs. Um, I think we're going to see more and more of it in cancer because we are understanding more about the cancer genome, which is allowing us to, um, or I should say cancer genomes, every cancer has its own genome, but we're, we're able to sequence them fast enough now that we can actually kind of learn more about the cancer and treat it appropriately. Um, and then I think we're going to see a lot more of the pharmacogenetic traits. So there's a network in the U.S. called the Pharmacogenetics or Pharmacogenomics Research Network that I'm a part of, and they're doing a lot of studies and a variety of drugs to try to understand drug responses. And, and I think collectively we've kind of decided that is where we should emphasize our time because understanding people's risk for disease, while interesting, if you can't alter something to change it, it's really just interesting or, or scary. And so we're spending more of our time trying to find drug treatment responses that we could change. So you know, depression is one. There's a lot going on. You know, when people come into the clinic and they're depressed, they go on a drug and then they observe. And then they go on another drug and observe. And if it didn't work, they go on another drug. And they, it's a, just a titration of drugs. They keep trying different things. And if you've ever seen commercials for depression drugs, they'll say, you may become tired, lethargic, sad, suicidal diarrhea, stomach, it has all these side effects that if you were depressed to start would only make you more depressed. So, so that's an area where they're spending a lot of time trying to understand, can we just figure out what you, what you should go on based on your DNA and just start there? And so I think we will see that in the next decade, I hope, because um, that's a, a clinical condition that's only been increasing and the treatments have not gotten much better. National Geographic also does genome sequencing. How is their report the same or different from 23andMe's report? If I want to do only one, which one would you suggest? Um, good question. I've not seen the, the raw data from the National Geographic um, sequencing. My guess is that it's more focused on um, population variation and ancestry just based on the types of things that they publish, but if they're using the same scientific literature that 23andMe is using to do, if they're doing the same type of clinical profiling, then, then I would say do whichever one is cheaper because the data are the data, and for certain things it's predictive and for other things it's not. And so I would, if you want to do it, spend less and get the accurate and inaccurate information that you can process at your leisure. Because you have a complex landscape to analyze, can you not use chaos theory? Oh, yeah, and a lot of investigators are. So it's not something I've done, but um, a lot of people are using um, fractals and, and chaos theory and doing kind of really sophisticated computer science modeling and trying to use that to understand that landscape. That's a great question, and it is being done, just not by me. It seems that there is a great need for genome data for future research. Is it feasible or desirable to develop a genome bank, either pre- or post-mortem, 
that would allow people to donate their genomes for research? Oh, great question. Um, yeah, so yes, it is definitely desirable, and it's happening um, all over the place, actually. So um, Francis Collins, who's currently the director of NIH, has been talking for years that we need the million American biobank. So we should try to collect a million Americans and put them in a biobank. And that's a really expensive project to do. And so what's happened instead is that healthcare facilities, many of them in the U.S., are starting their own biobanks linked to electronic medical records. So a lot of the work that I talked about from Vanderbilt, we did because we had a DNA bank of patients, and it's all linked to their electronic health record. And so um, I'm part of a network in the U.S. called the Emerge Network, which is electronic medical records and genomics. So they are comprised of um, Vanderbilt, Northwestern, Geisinger, Mount Sinai, Marshfield, Group Health, and two more. Who am I forgetting? Mayo Clinic, and I'm forgetting the last one. Anyway, there are seven in the U.S. And now, actually, there are Children's Hospitals. So Children's Hospital of Cincinnati, Philadelphia, and Boston are also now part of this network. And they are all creating biobanks linked to their electronic health records. And each one, I think collectively now, there's somewhere on the order of kind of 250,000 samples in this bio, all of the biobanks collectively. Um, and there are new ones starting. So, so Geisinger Clinic um, has one. Currently, it's only um, running out of Danville. But I imagine that over time, it will span to all of their um, satellite clinics. And um, Penn State Hershey Medical Center started their biobank and their Institute for Personalized Medicine this fall. And so they are starting to uh, accrue patients into a biobank, and then all of their data will be linked to their electronic health record. And so I think through these medical systems doing biobanks, if they team up, we will then get the million-person biobank and have decades of health information from their health record. So, so yeah, it's a great, great idea. We are currently doing it. We need it because we need big data in order to find some of these complex models. If the p-value is not significant, what pushes you to apply the results in the field? Is it the gene sequencing company or the pharmaceutical company? No, it's definitely not the sequencing company or the pharmaceutical company. I think what is pushing, the things that are not so significant that are being implemented, I think the reason is that if you go back into the lab and do the, the functional validations, these variants have actual functions. So they actually do something to change the protein. And so they can, can demonstrate in the lab that even though the statistics didn't show that it was you know, really strongly statistically significant, the effect is real and has a function. And so I think they're using more biological evidence rather than statistical evidence to, to push those into the clinic. I am one of seven siblings. My father's family has a history of some type 1 diabetes. Three of the seven siblings were diagnosed with type 1 within two months at ages 9, 16, and 27, and 37 years ago. What, nine, ages 9, 16, and 27, and that happened 37 okay. years ago. The other four siblings never contracted the disease. What happened? Well. My prediction would be that type 1 diabetes, like most complex traits, are complex. It's not only one gene. It's a combination of genes. Type 1 is less, we think, is less due to environment because it does happen typically at an early age where our environment is fairly controlled. So you know, children don't have all of those toxins that uh, we adults expose ourselves to. And so um, typically I would say it's you know, a complex array of genes that explains type 1, and you know, siblings share, on average, the same percentage of their genome, but what chunks of the genome are very different. And so you know, it sounds like some of the individuals in the family got the wrong combination of alleles or SNPs that led to the trait happening, and the other individuals were protected. Um, it happens a lot. So these are those traits. They're complex. They don't perfectly segregate in families. And, and that makes it a lot, a lot harder, but more interesting to study. With shortages of specific drugs in the market now that have produced measurable increase in mortality because alternative treatments were not as successful, 
How will the pharmaceutical market need to change to increase personalized care? That's a great question. So what a lot of companies have started doing recently, because they've been fighting personalized medicine for a long time, you know, drug companies want to design a drug that can be marketed to the m largest number of people possible. I and mean, that's how they make their money, by having a huge market. Personalized medicine is the complete opposite of that, where we have drugs that are for individuals or small subsets. But what they've realized is that a lot of drugs are failing during clinical trials. So it takes something like 15 years from like initiation of a drug design through all the clinical trials and FDA approvals, and it's I mean somewhere between seven and 15 years. I've heard you know different numbers, and so what they found out is that if they had done the clinical trials differently and they had subsetted their patients based on genetics, some drugs would not have failed clinical trials. So they found you know there are certain people that so that clopidogrel, clopidogrel example. If it doesn't work for people who have that variant, if those are the people who are in the trial for efficacy or how well the drug works, it's going to fail because they, it doesn't work for them. Um, if you happen to be looking at the side effects, the you know, phase two where we're looking for adverse events, then if you have people who have the risk variant that's going to make them have this hypersensitivity reaction, the drug's going to fail. If you can genotype people and then do the analysis of the clinical trial based on genotype and figure out it doesn't work for these people, toxic side effect for these people, but for these people it works, more drugs could get to market. And so a lot of pharmaceutical companies, GlaxoSmithKline, um, Roche, uh, you know, what is Bristol-Myers Squibb, Behringer Engelheim, they are all starting to do pharmacogenetic based clinical trials so that they can figure out which drugs will work for what subsets of their patient population, because they've realized even though the target market will be smaller, more of their drugs will make it through, because it's you know, a multi-million dollar industry to go from drug design through marketing, like to actually pass the trial. So, um, so they've realized kind of the bang for their buck is to actually find who it will work for and market it for them. And so I do think it, it's, ch it's already been changing and it'll continue to change. Now, I don't think we'll get to the point that I've heard some people talk about, you know, they'll sequence a genome and then they'll go in and design the drug for that person. Companies aren't super excited about that. <laughs> um, the market of one is really cost prohibitive. But the market for, you know, this age group, this ancestry, this body mass index, then we can start to get to, you know, large enough groups of people that it would matter. Since we know that the key to personalized medicine will be in gene environment interactions, what is the current status and strategies for gene environment research? Mm. Great question. Um, so a lot of epidemiologic studies are trying to do a better job of collecting the data so that people can do the analyses. So a lot of the statistics are already really well developed to do the analysis. We just don't have the data. So there are studies like the NHANES, which is run out of the CDC, um, the Women's Health Initiative, the Nurses' Health Study, the Physicians' Health Study, lots of studies where they're, they're collecting a lot of environmental data. But where I think it's going to work, and I'm super excited that Penn State Hershey, um, our sister campus, um, listened to me. I've been saying this for years, and when I was at Vanderbilt, nobody would ever listen to me. Um, I think what we need to do, so we're building these biobanks linked to our health records. Our health records have nothing about our environment, right? I mean, other than maybe the doctor will write, you know, 57-year-old female smoker. And, but then if they say, um, quit smoking, if you run an algorithm to find smoking, it'll find it. And then you have to find an algorithm, you have to, you know, look to see, did they quit or did they start? So my idea was that, you know, I go to the doctor and I sit in the waiting room forever bored to death waiting to see the doctor and then I have to go get a lab run and so I go and wait in the lab for another half an hour and I'm just sitting and sometimes I remember to bring something to read and sometimes I don't. Well if we're banking these people's DNA anyway and we have their health record why not give them an iPad with questionnaires that they can just sit there and go I ate this, I work outside, I sit at a computer, I painted with lead this week, whatever and you could answer the questions about yourself Every time you go to the clinic, it would give us something to do, and we'd get environmental data linked to our DNA and our health record. And so Penn State Hershey is actually implementing that in the clinics. They have 
um, tablets that they are giving people who are enrolled in the biobank that they can answer you know, health questionnaires, dietary questionnaires, family history questionnaires, and they're going to capture all that information so that it will be linked to the DNA and to the health record. And so I think that's where we need all of the medical facilities doing this banking to, to switch to that. Or do the online um, web forms. You know, most health centers now have the My Health at Geisinger or My Health at Vanderbilt. You know, they have a website where you can log in and message your doctor and do your appointment and look at your health record. Well, you know, some people have free time and they would love to log in and enter stuff about their diet or enter stuff about their exercise that week. And so if we give eager participants the ability to give us the data, just make it easy for them, then we'll get the information and then we can do the gene environment analyses much more effectively. So I think you know, the more we see of that, the, the better the, the studies will get. This question is about information flow in the opposite direction. What is the mechanism for providing um, clinically useful new medical genomics discoveries to doctors who treat patients? That varies quite a bit from facility to facility. Um, it's a big concern at the moment because most physicians today were trained in a time where we didn't 